à tarde. Nós vamos dar início, então, aos trabalhos do nosso Seminário Internacional Ciência Aberta, Questões Abertas. É, eu gostaria de convidar para a mesa de abertura o Alexandre Abdo, da Open de Brasil, Grupo Ciência Aberta, Universidade de São Paulo. A Maria Lúcia Maciel, que é uma co coordena junto comigo o LINC, Laboratório Interdisciplinar sobre Informação e Conhecimento, que é um laboratório conjunto do IBICT e da UFRJ. Ludmila Guimarães, é, da Unirio, é, representando aqui tanto o reitor da Unirio quanto a coordenadora do Centro de Educação à Distância da Unirio. E Cecília Leite, diretora do IBICT, Instituto Brasileiro de Informação em Ciência e Tecnologia. Queria primeiro agradecer é, a oportunidade de estarmos todos aqui, pessoas de várias partes do mundo, brasileiros de várias regiões do Brasil, para discutir um tema que para nós é muito caro, novo também, né, para, para as instituições de ensino e pesquisa brasileiras, mas eu acredito que para a sociedade em geral. Né, e é uma iniciativa, portanto, conjunta, que a gente espera que esteja dando, seja o primeiro passo de uma rede de um, que já existe, que a gente possa começar a participar mais ativamente dessa rede para discutir as questões envolvidas aí né, nisso que se chama de ciência aberta. É, eu não posso deixar de agradecer a todos que fizeram os esforços né, para que esse evento possa acontecer, trazendo tantas pessoas de fora, enfim, e, portanto, ao CNPq, ao IBICT, à FAPERJ, à CAPES, à Unirio, o CBPF, à RNP, o PPGCI, que é o Programa de Pós-Graduação em Ciência da Informação. Né. É, tivemos aí, antes, atividades pré-seminários, que foram pré-seminário, que foram as oficinas de ciência aberta, que nos Tivemos aí, durante ao longo de dois dias, cerca de sete oficinas acontecendo. Acho que foi uma experiência muito rica, que a gente espera poder replicar. Acho que foi uma primeira experiência. E agradecer a todos aqueles que botaram a, ma a mão na massa, né, como a gente diz, para fazer esse evento. Além de nós, que estamos aqui na mesa, né, que eu já mencionei, as equipes de apoio da Unirio, que todos os esforços aí para pegar as pessoas, viabilizar a vinda dos brasileiros, né? uma das apoiadoras da publicação que a gente pretende fazer a partir daqui, é o pessoal do IBICT de Brasília, o pessoal do IBICT do Rio de Janeiro, Selma e sua equipe, nossos, nossos alunos de iniciação científica, de mestrado e doutorado, Helena, Sabrina, Anne Clínio, André Apel, enfim, eu acho que é uma enormidade de pessoas que a gente tem que agradecer muitíssimo por esse apoio voluntário né, a essa a organização desse evento. Então, eu vou passar a palavra para o Alexandre Abdo, para ele dizer algumas palavras. Bom, bom dia a todos, boa tarde. É, eu estou super contente de estar aqui. A gente, ano passado... É, só para contar um pouquinho de, de, do processo, talvez muito rapidamente, um grupo de colegas aí que trocavam, se encontravam em, em eventos, em encontros científicos, começou a reconhecer que existia é, uma massa crítica de pessoas interessadas diretamente em trabalhar de maneira mais é, colaborativa, mais com espírito mais público dentro da ciência, e, e que havia uma série de fatores que no nosso dia a dia criavam uma resistência a isso, fatores institucionais, mas também fatores da nossa própria dificuldade de, de, de não conhecer essas práticas, de, de não estar compartilhando sobre essas práticas, aprendendo com o erro dos outros, com os acertos dos outros. E a gente começou a, a criar uma lista de e-mail, a trocar ideias, e a partir daí, é, fizemos ano passado um primeiro encontro, né, que foi muito feliz, a gente conseguiu fazer tudo de maneira é, bastante é, colaborativa e aberta, com tudo registrado online e tal. É, e ver isso tomar forma e ser abraçado, de certa forma, é, e abraçado mutuamente, né? um abraço mesmo, não, não um, um, uma fagocitação, mas um abraço bem caloroso, é, por, 
por outras pessoas maravilhosas que estão aqui e, e aí sentadas também. É incrível. Eu espero que a gente possa fazer um ótimo seminário. A gente, sem dúvida, tem um material é, dos dois lados e online também. A gente vai ter participação remota. É, mais do que suficiente. Então, muito obrigado a todos. O evento está sendo transmitido né, em tempo real, tem um endereço aí para o streaming. Não sei se, talvez depois a gente devesse colocar ali para quem quiser divulgar. E também nós estamos filmando, gravando e filmando o evento. Né, então, a ideia é depois a gente ter um vídeo é, de, de, do seminário que vai ser amplamente disponibilizado aí para aqueles que não puderam vir e aqueles que gostariam de rever alguns dos grandes bons momentos, os grandes momentos do seminário. Então, eu passo a palavra para a Maria Lúcia Marcel. Carita já agradeceu várias pessoas e entidades, que eu também agradeço. Já isso é óbvio. Quero também agradecer ao Alexandre, que nos fez, em grande parte, descobrir esse novo mundo, que é um mundo que eu estou achando fascinante e que a gente descobriu nesse primeiro encontro no Rio, que ele esqueceu de dizer, disse que foi ótimo, só que não te... acabou a luz aqui, nesse auditório, repentinamente. Alguém, tá, alguém lá estava aqui, porque estava dizendo, é, pois é. E, é, em cinco minutos, a Sarita arrumou lá fora um auditório no jardim. Claro, não tínhamos a tela, mas foi muito agradável, não foi? Foi muito legal. Então, enfim, nossa história com o Alexandre vem mais ou menos daí, eu agradeço. Agradeço a vocês todos por estarem aqui, é muito bom. Agradeço aos que vieram de fora, que aceitaram o nosso convite. Alguns deles vieram de muito longe, tipo Singapura, Austrália, enfim. Agradeço a todos vocês. É, para nós isso está sendo muito importante. Nós estamos entrando num campo novo de pesquisa e eu confesso que eu estou fascinada. É, eu não vou falar muito mais, mas eu queria só contar que na semana passada eu aprendi uma coisa que eu não sabia. Não sei se vocês sabem, que não é toda e qualquer abelha que faz mel. Vocês sabiam disso? Eu não sabia. Acho, para mim, a abelha faz mel, ponto. Mas não. Não são todas que fazem mel. Muitas abelhas, elas simplesmente se reproduzem, botam os ovos lá num, num cantinho, vão embora e fecham a porta, por assim dizer. Elas fecham a entrada e vão embora, não acontece mais nada. Simplesmente os outros nascem e vão repetir o mesmo ciclo de vida, sem qualquer tipo de produção. E aí existem as chamadas abelhas sociais, as abelhas que trabalham juntas e que produzem, e essas produzem mel, cera, própolis, é, geleia real, e elas trabalham juntas, é um monte de abelha trabalhando junto. Então, eu acho que nós temos aqui algo em comum com as abelhas, eu acho que nós vamos ser muito mais produtivos trabalhando todo mundo junto. Vamos lá. Então, vou chamar a Ludmilla. E o Ibic de 60 anos. Você esqueceu do livro? Eu não esqueci ah. de 60 anos. Eu esqueci de falar do site do grupo de trabalhos. Quem, quem está assistindo e não conhece ainda, o site ciênciaaberta.net é a porta de entrada para participar desse grupo de trocas, de experiências e, e, e de aprendizados e de é, espaço também de eventualmente lutas aí que a gente vai precisar fazer para que tem espaço essa forma de encarar o nosso trabalho científico. Já viu que essa mesa, em termos de marketing institucional, é zero. Né? Boa tarde a todos. É um prazer estar aqui nessa mesa de abertura, é, representando né, o reitor da Universidade Federal do Estado de Janeiro e a Coordenação Geral de Educação à Distância. É, passo o coro aqui com a potência dos afetos do, do Alexandre, né, e colocado muito bem pela, pela Maria Lúcia, de que somente esse trabalho 
colaborativo, somente essa integração e esse compartilhamento de recursos, que, no final das contas, é produto né, desse afeto, né, desse conjunto de ideias e de crenças que nós partilhamos e que possibilita que estejamos todos aqui e que, poss que podemos avançar né, é, em, em rumo a coisas novas, a criações, que é bem a tônica né, desse seminário, quando a gente vê o que os nossos... É, palestrantes, o que os nossos conferencistas vêm fazendo, não é nada é, mais do que essa potência dos afetos, através dos trabalhos com as comunidades, com as novas opções de ferramentas, de instrumentos, é esse partilhar, é essa ideia né, de uma comunidade que extrapola os territórios e as fronteiras, né, que o Alexandre é, bem, bem coloca, a Sarita, a Luca, né, e provavelmente também a Cecília. Né? É com muito carinho é, que eu estou aqui nesse, nesse momento, porque faço parte né, dessa, desses afetos, né, e sou cria dessa, dessa escola, e foi um prazer receber alguns professores no aeroporto, estar tá nessa, nessa mão na massa, é, viabilizando né, algumas coisas, para que nesse somatório possamos todos crescer e caminhar adiante. Então, muito obrigada a todos e que tenhamos um excelente evento. Obrigada. Acho que aqui está dando. Bom, obrigado. Em primeiro lugar, agradeço o convite da Sarita para estar aqui compartilhando desse momento, no ano em que o IBICT comemora os seus 60 anos, e esse evento faz parte dessas comemorações, porque, na verdade, ele vem ao encontro do que sempre foi uma das missões e uma das metas do IBICT, que é o acesso aberto à informação. A gente já vem trabalhando nisso antes de ser denominado dessa forma, mas a gente sempre teve essa ideia de que a informação tem que ser aberta, tem que ser livre, tem que ser compartilhada, para que ela possa gerar efetivamente conhecimento, desenvolvimento e inovação nesse novo momento. Então, eu parabenizo a todos que organizaram esse evento, a importância que ele tem se mede pela distância das pessoas que aqui vieram, nesse abraço ao acesso aberto, e isso fortalece muito o IBICT e esse novo momento dele, na medida em que está no seu plano de ação para esses próximos quatro anos, o desenvolvimento muito forte dessa questão do acesso aberto, dos repositórios para isso, do, do Big Data, do mapa de competência. Nós estamos com várias iniciativas nesse sentido e acho que tudo isso se soma àquilo que está sendo discutido aqui e acredito que vá enriquecer o que nós estamos fazendo. Então, eu quero desejar sucesso absoluto, dizer que para o IBICT é uma grande alegria fazer parte desse grupo que está levando esse movimento à frente, e que esperamos que daqui saiam frutos que possam render, assim como foi colocado a questão das abelhas, possam render geleia real, porque eu acho que a gente tem aqui todas as operárias, todos os tipos de, de, de trabalho para que isso aconteça, mas que, no fundo, a gente possa render um conhecimento maior, uma integração maior e a possibilidade de desenvolvimento desses, desses projetos que para o IBICT são extremamente caros e importantes. Muito obrigada e sucesso durante esses dias. É, vamos ao trabalho. É, é, peço, então, que a gente desfaça a mesa de abertura, que a Luca se mantenha aí para conduzir, então, a nossa sessão, nossa conferência de abertura. Thank you for your patience. Again, I want to thank the, uh, the organizers for the invitation uh, to come uh, to, uh, to Brazil and to Rio. This is my first visit uh, to, uh, to this wonderful country. Uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, the other, uh, some of the other speakers uh, with whom uh, I've spent uh, some of the workshop time which is uh, help in my uh, education to catch up uh, with the, the uh, excuse, not, not working, working. Hello? Okay. I have to hold this in my teeth. Uh, uh, maybe it's better this way. 
not so good that way. I don't know what is generating the positive feedback from that, but in any case, uh, the, as I was saying, uh, I've had uh, an, an education uh, in uh, what I've uh, come to call uh, uh, the the new open science movement. Uh, because what I want to talk uh, about today is uh, open science, the Republic of Open Science, uh, which is an old set uh, of, in of institutions and an old mode of conducting research. Uh, so we might uh, want to call it the traditional open science movement, as opposed to the plans for the renewal of open science uh, for the 21st century and, and beyond, which I've been hearing about. Um, so what I want to do is to, to start with a perspective of where I have come from. Um, the discipline I have come from is from economics, and uh, I've been in, involved uh, not in an uh, institute of politics and economics directly, but in an uh, institute concerned with uh, research on economic policies and economic policy issues, which include issues of science policy, modern science policy. And the other place that I've come from is from the past, uh, not, be, not only because I'm very old, uh, but uh, because I've studied the past, uh, because I believe uh, that there are many things about the existing world which are very difficult to understand uh, unless you know how they got that way. And that many things uh, which we uh, are coping with, or struggling with, uh, find uh, irrational uh, are legacies from the past which have persisted uh, because they have an important functional value which has kept them uh, alive and able to resist uh, sort of the, uh, the pressures uh, for change or, or disintegration. Uh, and they are being renewed. Uh, consequently, the renewal takes place in terms of a uh, adaptation and continual evolution of the earlier uh, forms. Uh, it is not uh, usually a complete revolution which discards which discards them uh, because, as I've said, uh, they persist uh, as legacies because they continue to have some functional value, even though uh, they are not perfect institutions uh, or perfectly adapted to changing needs. So this is the context in which uh, I, want to, uh, I want to approach this problem. So here, uh, uh, this is a, a menu, but um, uh, for, for for this uh, talk, this is not the menu from which you can, uh, which you are freely ordered. So it's one of those uh, restaurants where you get a set menu. Uh, okay, and the question is whether whether you want whether you want to take that dish or not. Uh, but that's uh, that's what is on offer. Uh, uh, so I will start uh, by trying, uh, as uh, I was taught uh, uh, by. Uh, senior people when I began a teaching career very long ago, before we had, uh, we had any digital technologies or, or even were supposed to provide graphical information in classroom presentations other than what we could draw on the blackboard. Uh, and so the motivation uh, for this topic and for the work that I've done uh, on the economics of research and the economic history uh, of research organizations so this is the motivation, and I will try to, uh, uh, to follow the advice that I was given, which was in giving a lecture, you first tell people what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them, and then you conclude by telling them what you have told them, okay? And this is the formula uh, for, uh, for, sta for standard uh, lec uh, lecturing. Uh, okay, and so we, we will start with this program. Uh, so I start with the critical importance of exploratory research for major advances in scientific knowledge. Distinguishing here uh, between 
exploratory research and including in that long-term mission-oriented uh, research activities and distinguished from uh, short-term uh, applied research and particularly research uh, which is intended to have co commercial applications. Uh, in regard to this exploratory research, uh, open science institutions uh, have demonstrated comparative efficiency vis-a-vis um, -vis other modes of organization, and I'll describe them. Uh, even though what these set of institutions are is a co very complex uh, system uh, formed of informal no norms uh, developed within the research communities, and that means that there is not one set of standard norms, but the set of variants of norms which are adapted to the needs of particular scientific domains and the cultures in which those have been more fully elaborated. Thank you. So these are the practices which are associated with what I continue to call uh, open science. Open science is not simply a tool set. It is a set of organizational forms and institutionalized practices which are embedded in a larger society uh, and therefore uh, are adapted uh, to other features of that society with, with, upon which they depend in some cases and against which they struggle in other cases. There are some implications uh, of that uh, regarding the way in which it is possible to transform these institutions without disrupting them to the point that they lose their functional uh, capabilities, particularly their unique ones. The self-organized collective creativity of open science uh, has, as I will argue, been very important in the way in which the community is working, largely those communities based in academic institutions, uh, but some, some cases in, gov in government uh, and private, uh, the private institute of research, the way they have responded to modern uh, set of re relatively recent external threats. Uh, and this response uh, and creativity in the formation of this institutional structure, uh, not necessarily as a purposeful plan, but as a self-organized and evolving process, uh, is as important in recent times as it was in the origins of these institutions. Okay? Um, and that is an interesting feature in that the capability, if you like, uh, of a, a social groups at a, the point of the emergence and initial stabilization of the set of practices which are which called open science, historically has not been a capability which has been lost uh, in the subsequent development and the elaboration of these institutions, even though the process of institutionalization often uh, can, be, uh, can be crippling uh, to creativity and to the ability uh, to introduce uh, important uh, changes uh, which, are, which preserve uh, uh, the, the practice. Okay? So this is, uh, if you like, a happy, a happy history of something which arose uh, and conceived uh, in a rather spontaneous uh, reaction to a past set of circumstances, but which was not lost in the process of its institutionalization. The universalist and collectivist pursuit of scientific knowledge, uh, self-organized by the respective research communities, resonates much more strongly with the ethos of the early Renaissance's public, uh, Republic of Letters than with the metaphorical notion of the market for ideas, uh, which means that a lot of initial analysis by economists we try to use the market paradigm to understand the allocation of resources uh, within 
uh, open science, were misled uh, by uh, picking the wrong metaphor, uh, which is surprising in a sense uh, that, as I will argue and show you, that modern economics uh, has one of its tenets in the development of an economics of information has shown that, e that information, which is what is produced uh, by scientific research and what scientific research uses as an input for further production, that information is not a normal commodity. It's a commodity uh, which is allocated, which can, is not allocated efficiently by market pro by market competitive market processes. So the view I will present is of open science as belonging to a larger class of decentralized, distributed, non-market systems of knowledge and information production uh, and distribution uh, that are important, intricate, interesting, uh, but only recently have begun to be studied uh, by economists uh, in a movement which was called uh, the New Economics of Science movement, which I had a part uh, yeah, in, in launching uh, in the late 70s. So open science is then a comparatively efficient but hardly perfect system of resource allocation for production producing reliable new knowledge, but uh, it does perform comparatively poorly in the task of capturing the social surpluses or the, the, the beneficial uh, results of the new knowledge uh, in, the uh, in the exploitation of existing knowledge. It does well in the generation and in the continuing advance uh, of scientific understanding and uh, the foundations for technological advance, you know, but it does not translate these into immediately uh, and naturally into the solution of, so of society's problems. Other mechanisms are required uh, for, uh, for, the, for that purpose. One of the principal mechanisms is through the interaction between the regime of open science and the proprietary R&D research regime uh, at the macro level, that is, at the macro institutional level, not within a given organization, but in the larger system in which it is embedded, embedded it is uh, market systems which are responsive at some levels, not perfectly, to social needs, but also can be responsible to signals uh, from, uh, a, from governments which are enlightened and attempt to correct uh, the malallocation of resources arising from private interest as distinct uh, from uh, mechanisms through which uh, public interest can be expressed uh, and signaled uh, through, through the market by intervention in the market processes. But it is, in the end, the, the private system sort of motivated by private gains, uh, which is, turns out to be more responsive and more externally uh, influenced by feedback from what people want, expressed either through their, through their, gover through their government representatives uh, and a representative state or uh, through uh, the workings of, of competitive markets. So this interaction is one in which you can see the two systems functioning in a, as complements. Okay. If uh, they are kept in appropriate balance with one another. Maintaining that balance is, as I say on the text, the central science and technology policy challenge for modern economies. Uh, uh, and it, and it is, it is a, a continuous and persisting challenge. It's not amenable to a one-time to a one-time fix, because within both the, each of the subsystems there are uh, changes and differences which disturb their their relationship, and so the case of, of rebalancing uh, is a is a continual role uh, for uh, for science and technology policy, uh, one which is often not uh, recognized and which the political process is not very 
uh, is not very good for because the payoffs to this are really in long term, in terms of long term progress. Uh, in, in the short run, uh, the imbalances may turn out to serve the needs of, of both private interest or the political or the political uh, class, uh, uh, who who generally have a very short time horizon, uh, which uh, lasts uh, from their their assured term in office or their chance of being returned uh, to, uh, polit to political positions. But finally, open science, like other cooperative institutional arrangements, uh, is fragile in, uh, in its performance. It is dependent upon external support. Uh, uh, and hence, the overall performance of the research system in modern economies itself uh, is uh, at risk if the fragile character of one of its important subsystems, the open science system, is not protected and defended uh, from things which would degrade its performance and therefore degrade the long-term performance of the system as a whole. So this is a very strong motivation to try to uh, spread an understanding of this system uh, even to people who are working within it uh, and who see it within a particular institutional setting. In a particular institutional setting, the things I have said about the complementarity of the two uh, systems, the proprietary system and the open science system, uh, does not manifest itself because they are competitive for resources and a system driven uh, by uh, pr private interests as opposed uh, to the cooperative uh, impulse and to collaborative uh, work is much more readily undermined by competition from resources uh, from from the other system uh, and so uh, and it has uh, it doesn't have uh, the, the rapid uh, capability of mobilizing resources in part because it is dependent upon uh, for support from the outside since the terms of its existence and its special qualities do not allow it uh, to uh, generate uh, new resources by uh, selling access uh, to the knowledge which it generates, which, which it produces. It does not capture the ben a large portion for itself of the benefits, and therefore it does not create a, a, a stock of uh, financial assets or others which can be used to mobilize uh, defense against competitive attack from outside as a large corporation uh, would. So putting the two systems within one institution is a prescription to have them degrade each other's performance and get the system which is sub, uh, suboptimal, which in a, in a line is why is the, the rationale for the defense against the introduction of commercialization into an institution like acad academic institutions or public research institutions. Because what you get is, uh, is, a, is a combination not a useful hybrid like a mule, uh, but something which performs worse uh, than either of the subsystems separately. So, if you can come away with the, with that set uh, that set of ideas from from this talk, uh, uh, you will you will have everything which it took me a long time to work out uh, for myself uh, as to why I was doing this and why it was important. Okay, so now we will we can regress. Uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, what is the supporting framework of ideas, um, uh, which uh, which give uh, which give some uh, underpinnings uh, to the arguments that I have made uh, about uh, the organization of research. So we start with the peculiarity uh, of information, which holds the key in the sense to why uh, we have different institutions and modes for organizing research activity in modern societies, okay? Um, now, the typical economist, a historical answer to this um, uh, for, the, for the case for publicly funded open science uh, goes uh, uh, as, as follows uh, in, in compressed form. Uh, so as I've said, Information, which is the key input, as well as the output 
of research has public goods properties. The public goods properties are not the properties of things which are produced in the public se sector. They may be the rationale for the fact that they are produced in the public sector, but they are not definitionally uh, what is done in the public sector. Public goods properties consist of three attributes. Uh, the first uh, I like to call uh, infinite expansibility. In other words, the marginal cost of transferring information uh, to another party uh, is negligible in comparison to the cost of its production. It is characterized by high costs of the first copy and, and diminishing marginal cost, incremental cost of producing other copies. Secondly, these kinds of goods are characterized by a high degree of indivisibility. In other words, I can't produce a very small amount of an idea. An idea is an integral. Uh, it's an integral thing. It may have different parts, but each one of them are integral. So you can build something larger from some component. But each of the com constituent elements is itself uh, integral. Uh, and that means that it does not have a pro the, pro the superadditivity pro property which characterizes ordinary commodities. If I have a one lump of coal and I give, get another lump of coal, which is essentially chemically identical to it, I have two lumps of coal. If I have one idea, okay, uh, some, let's take something something which is operational, algorithmic. I, I understand how, how to calculate uh, a, a derivative uh, uh, of a function, okay? And somebody comes in and tells me the same thing again, okay? I don't have two ideas. I still have one idea, okay? So the com constituent pieces of the information uh, are, heterog are heterogeneous, if they are recognizably different than they really are, not the same thing, so that they are not the standard commodity, which is produced many lumps of coal, many, uh, many ears of corn, uh, they are different. Uh, and they have all have first costs, which are, high in, which are high in relationship to the ability to disseminate uh, this, that the marginal cost of dissemination is very large. For the the third property is that it takes some substantial resource cost to prevent uh, others uh, from uh, having access uh, to this uh, information. Okay? Um, it frequently, information about something uh, like a, a process, the, a recipe, uh, becomes divulged by simply performing it. Okay? Knowledge of the process speaks up. Things can be reverse engineered uh, once you see how, uh, you know, what it does. You can think of taking it apart and figuring out uh, what are the principles that allowed it to do it. Or if I want to give you the recipe for something, a uh, new uh, and tasty product, or one which is slightly uh, addictive, uh, such as uh, Coca-Cola, the original drink, have a, have, have a good bit of cocaine in it, uh, uh, or cocaine derivatives. Uh, uh, it was sold as a syrup, and it was distributed uh, at uh, soda fountains uh, in which uh, people mixed the syrup uh, in, a, in a glass uh, with sparkling water, with a carbonated water. So you know, somebody had an idea for greatly improving this product, but the problem was to figure out how uh, to be rewarded for the idea. So you approach, you, you approach the person and say, I've got a fantastic idea. It will be worth thousands, millions for you. Uh, and if you pay me this amount of money, which is not very large in relationship to its total benefits, I'll give it to you. And the person says, well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, well, tell me what it is. And they say, no, I don't want to tell you what it is, because if I tell you what it is, uh, you'll know. You'll know enough, okay? Uh, 
Okay? Uh, so the, uh, this is called in economics a transactional externality. That is to say, the act of transacting in uh, the commodity itself confers benefit for the person who has yet to pay for it, okay? Entering into the transaction. Uh, in the case of Coca-Cola, uh, there, there was a real transaction uh, in which the uh, person says, uh, I will write my idea on a piece of paper, okay? And uh, it, will be, it will be deposited and you, you can look at it, uh, but you have to leave the piece of paper there as evidence then I let you look at it, uh, and uh, if you use this, you will pay me this amount, which I want you to put on in bond, okay? You have to deposit it with a piece of paper in this secure place. Huh? And so the deal was affected, uh, and this formula, which is still kept as a trade secret today by the Coca-Cola company, uh, consisted of two words on a piece of paper. Does anybody know what the two words are? Well, you can translate it into Portuguese, but in English, it's bottle it. <laughs> okay, put it in a bottle already mixed. Huh? This, this was a, a, a major commercial breakthrough. Okay. Okay. This idea about information and public goods is not new. Uh, one of the famous, uh, I'm a great fan of Thomas Jefferson uh, as, a, as an intellect. Uh, all intellects and all people have, have their, uh, their drawbacks. And uh, he, was a, he was an exceptional man of his age uh, and he, uh, in, keeping, in keeping slaves and so forth. He, uh, he, was, uh, he was no, uh, no better and no worse than many other slaveholders. In fact, he was on average uh, better. But what he said uh, uh, pointed out uh, that, uh, I won't read the whole quote, you can read it yourself, but he, he pointed out in the, in the part that's underlined, he says, he who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine. This is the notion that he, the thing that's special about ideas is that they can be simultaneously used without exhausting them. Okay? You don't use up my ability to take derivatives uh, by, uh, uh, by doing it yourself with the information I've given you, okay? Uh, he receives light without darkening me. And I, I like the second part of the metaphor. He says that ideas should freely spread from one to another over the globe for the moral and mutual instruction of man. And the improvement of his condition seems to have been peculiarly and benevolently designed by nature when she made them like fire expansible over all space without lessening their density at any point, and like the air in which we breathe, move, and have our physical being incapable of confinement and exclusive appropriation. Okay. These principles, which uh, uh, were in a letter uh, to an inventor in 1813, uh, in which he was trying to persuade the inventor uh, that there was no natural right uh, to be able to possess information uh, and monopolize it by a patent. That that was a matter of state, <coughs> uh, state policy, uh, and it may have its uses, but the natural rights argument, which followers of Locke uh, uh, were, were pushing, uh, did not give any justification uh, for that. So people who were denied a patent were not denied any, uh, any, uh, any natural right. And these are exactly the terms that came quite independently to be articulated uh, uh, in the modern, uh, in modern uh, information economics, uh, first by uh, Kenneth Arrow, a colleague of mine at, at Stanford, uh, and, a, and a Nobel Prize reci recipient uh, for that and, and many other contributions. So e economic implications are that competitive markets fail to allocate public goods efficiently due to the transactional externality and due to the possibility of free riding, uh, that you provide it uh, and hope people will pay, uh, but if people can, uh, can use it and get it from someone else, since it costs them nothing uh, to share the idea, it doesn't diminish uh, their use of it, uh, so free riding 
uh, is very uh, is very easy, and you have to take uh, elaborate steps you know, to keep something uh, secret. Competitive pricing, at which will be at incremental cost, at incremental marginal cost, uh, will essentially price this commodity at negligible cost for the marginal, the cost of providing the marginal unit, in which case you cannot recoup the first cost uh, unless you have some other kind of arrangement. Uh, and so external, the external use benefits of such goods do not, uh, are not going to be properly valued by the willingness of private parties to pay for it. And in this case, the argument is that public goods need to be uh, collectively uh, funded uh, through an apparatus like a tax system uh, which then allocates resources or uh, in which a, a government entity uh, borrows on the strength of its credit in order to provide uh, public infrastructure, uh, public health services, and so forth. Uh, so so the, there's an entire structure which is very important in the economics of public finance, uh, which has worked through all of this, but it's taken a long time before this uh, this uh, analysis came to be applied to understand the workings of research uh, organizations, right? which dealt in information. The classic analysis uh, suggests uh, three uh, mechanisms, tax finance subsidies for producing public good like uh, water, lighting utility, uh, some transport, transport services. So you, you subsidize the activity through general taxes, you or you create a monopoly, a state-created monopoly, and allow the monopolist uh, to collect uh, a profit uh, by charging more than the actual marginal cost for railway tickets or for uh, uh, consignments uh, shipped as cargo. Or uh, you actually have the state provide the service. In other words, it is not a private railway, it's a state railway, the state produces it. Or you have government research labs. So the corresponding identity, which I, I call the three Ps, are the coexisting in solution, institutional solutions to the problem proposed by information goods. And these are patronage, okay? And the open science reward system is a devolved system of patronage in representative governments through which the public it becomes the patron, but it's, uh, it has the state acting as its agent, uh, in essentially collecting uh, taxes and revenue, uh, which is then used uh, to, uh, to get, uh, to patronize, uh, provide support for others who will produce uh, this uh, public good. Or property which is a market solution, but it's not the free market solution because what it does is create the monopoly, okay? And the monopoly takes the form of intellectual property monopolies, which allow the monopoly holders uh, to extract uh, a, a surplus uh, from, the, from the users. The effects of, the sur of this surplus extraction will limit, as everybody I think understands, the access uh, to this. Uh, either financially limited or uh, in, in order to be sure that people uh, do not avoid paying uh, the, the high markup uh, to get uh, the journal article, uh, people resort uh, to legal systems to enforce uh, the, monopoly, the monopoly right, or they think about uh, technological systems uh, so, you know, such as uh, what, you know, what, what are called DM, DMR, uh, for the, which is you know, intellectual, intellectual property management uh, systems, uh, which, which are a, a technological enforcement, uh, which can be introduced even if you have no right to protect it. Once you, once you do it, this is sometimes called self-help, uh, that you, you manage, you put something behind an encrypted wall, uh, and then uh, you allow people to enter through the wall, but you charge them uh, what the traffic will bear, okay? So one can recognize this in the, in the marketing practices of, of certain uh, scientific journals. Okay? 
or a procurement policy, which is the state uh, runs the production uh, or, so, uh, or sources this, but the state manages the production activity. Okay. So we see, we see this. And so systems uh, in, in the modern world uh, use each of these different devices because they each have some pros and cons, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to go uh, into, into all, of, uh, into all of, of the details, but uh, there, was a period, there was a period of time in which each of these had been developed sufficiently, sometimes uh, more in one country than in another, uh, but they all could see the other models and see where it might be useful, uh, and so uh, what you have in the simplex diagram is a, a sense that there is some balance. This is a, more or less an equal an equal balance of using these techniques for different, uh, for different uh, kinds of research activities uh, and funding them that way. So now the question is, what is special about uh, the open science mode of organizing research which justifies its support? So it's, as I've argued, especially functional in promoting rapid accumulation process uh, for advancing a reliable knowledge. And it does this through a, diff a series of different aspects. It has, starts with a collegiate reputational reward structure, which provides incentives and signals for agents' efforts uh, and their allocation decisions. That is, the, the peer representation, the collegiate representational reward system ties uh, your access to the resources to do research as well as uh, to, uh, to, earn, to earn a living to uh, the reputation that you acquire uh, by virtue of your performance of this activity in the eyes of the research community. Okay. This is in turn based on the principle of priority uh, of discovery uh, and a claim to have been first. And one can see uh, that this, uh, th this system is, uh, is almost necessitated by uh, the property of information. Uh, because uh, suppose uh, we, we have a new, uh, a new idea, a new uh, technique, uh, which uh, is produced by, uh, you know, by uh, Rachel, Sophie appears and say, no, I actually thought of this. I worked this all out in the back the other night or two or three weeks ago. In fact, it was two, it was two months ago, long before, the, before this paper appeared. And so the question is, well, should we reward Sophie for this? Well, the answer is what we care about, it's making it public, okay? Now we care about making it public because that's a good in itself, disclosure, but it's the only way that we can ascertain who did it first. Right. So this is an incentive to publish uh, um, more quickly uh, if you can. Sometimes it creates an incentive to publish too quickly. Right. All right, so this is the, this is, this is the problem. That the, that the components of this system um, fit together in one state, but they can also produce side effects which are not, uh, uh, not so desirable. Now, that's the last point on the slide. Uh, this is a term of art among economists, incentive compatibility. Incentive compatibility uh, refers to the idea that the incentive structure actually incentivizes something that people are going to find uh, natural and aligned with their own interests. Right? So even though the in incentive structure it occurs from outside, but it's if you like, it's one that works for them. And not all incentives uh, are like that. So the problem, the problem is uh, that in the early stages, people possess different information. Okay? If you've worked on something in the lab, you know a lot more about it than the director of the lab or the head of the company uh, or, uh, or, your, or a fellow scientist. And so the question is, so you have this um, problem. Uh, you can't really monitor the 
a contribution of somebody by clocking up how many hours uh, they have spent uh, in the lab. Okay, because a lot of my friends, particularly in, in physics uh, and in mathematics, say that they do most of their serious work in the bathtub. Okay, it's those moments when they relax or their mind clears that they always get. You know, they figure out what it is that they that they have been working on that they can really go ahead with. Okay, so we would have to have a way of monitoring people in the shower. Or in, I, I actually, I don't do very well in the bath. I tend to relax and fall asleep. But in the shower is is where I, uh, that's where I, where where I can think. Uh, so uh, the the reward. You create an incentive in which the reward for rapid disclosure, which gives you a better chance in the claim for priority, is what elicits uh, the public uh, good of releasing this and make it, making it available uh, for, uh, for others uh, to do various, uh, various things with. Uh, try to use it, and in that process, validate the claim. Okay? Find out uh, if it has any uh, adverse side effects, uh, uh, which have not been thought of by the expender, depending upon changing, changing the circumstances in which it's used uh, may lead something that works positively in one situation to produce something uh, which is noxious in, a, in another. Uh, and so people's, the, vi the variation in uses uh, will uh, eventually un uncover these bugs, okay? And so I, I'll give you the, the reference because a lot of people are more familiar with, soft, with software than they are with things that, that go on in labs. Okay. So, so then we come to these propositions which I referred to is that open science is suited for maximizing the growth of the stock of reliable knowledge, whereas proprietary research is suited better for maximizing the volume of economic rents, that is to say social surplus extracted from the existing stock. Okay. The problematic aspects of the performance of the, private, of the proprietary system uh, lie often in uh, the effort uh, to get reward leads to the overpricing, that is to say excess pricing above cost, which in turn deters uh, people's access uh, when uh, there is not a competitive market which will drive down, uh, compete away uh, the, excess, uh, the excess profit. So, um, and this gives rise to the superior efficiency. Okay. And this is reiterates the point that I've made, you know, that uh, combining uh, the two systems within a single institution uh, is, a is a prescription uh, for making each of them function worse because now you have two reward systems uh, where you can get rewarded in the university for your patenting activity uh, and for keeping your work secret in your lab, for closing your lab, for telling your graduate students that they can't talk to anybody else uh, who isn't working on the project, for, for not discussing your work with your colleagues. In other words, shutting down the information flow, which would enhance the research process, possibly, okay, uh, and would uh, allow dissemination of techniques and procedures which could be improved by other people's suggestions, okay? So that's one set of incentives. Uh, and then the other is to collaborate and to work, uh, to work in a cooperative fashion. Uh, okay. So you get an incentive to the extent that you, your colleagues say, it's a, this person is a very useful person to have in our department. May not be the first name on the papers, but she has actually done all of the difficult work uh, with reagents. Uh, so, or she has kept the cell lines alive. We couldn't have done any of this work without her, even though she, you know, she, is not, she is not recognized as the person who generated the project, but terribly useful. So this kind of structure and reward system can be, uh, again, it's in the interest of people in the work group to reward productive members of the group, even though in terms of their uh, visibility from outside, people who are not involved in the production process and only care about the output, uh, you'll get, you get a, different, a different answer. Uh, so th this, uh, th these reward systems uh, have different 
give you different results. And if you put them both into the same organization, what you get is a lot of organizational confusion and, and ambiguity. Uh, and, and one can see that, uh, that private corporations do not mix incentive structures. They do not mix hiring principles. If you are going to hire people on a meritocratic <coughs> basis, you can't promote them on the basis of their, uh, of their actual uh, re relationship to marriage uh, or heredity uh, with, other, with other members of the organization who are in, a hi in the hierarchy, okay? And similarly, uh, probably if you, if, you, if you are very meritocratic inside uh, and you are keeping people outside uh, for ascriptive or other reasons, which are not correlated with their ability, uh, then people say, well, you're managing, you're, you sort of have a meritocratic system, but you're managing the intake in a way that's biased and which will favor the advancement of certain people, okay? So th these, these conflicts within organizations are a subject which organizational uh, sociology, psychology, and research management deals with within, uh, within entities, okay? And the question is, okay, uh, so the restraints exist there are not ones which, which the university administrations have any ex uh, experience with, uh, and they have themselves mixed motives, and so that leads to, that leads to problems. Okay, so let me do move more quickly because I think this may be more fami familiar. Uh, doesn't come from economics, it comes really from the early sociology of science, uh, defined by, by Robert Merton uh, and his students. And uh, focused in, uh, first, in this case, on the ethos and norms and the institutions which distinguish the Republic of Open Science, uh, uh, and give an answer to the to the reasons as to why you have different organizational regimes. Uh, but they pose the question as to how such a strange system could arise uh, in a circumstance which it, in which it did, which it arose from a world of secret knowledge and the secret of country. For nature's, uh, for nature's secret, uh, and ambiguity about the dis disclosure of new knowledge to the hoi polloi, uh, so that this was the province of elites uh, who, uh, who could be uh, needed, uh, needed to be uh, those who uh, made decisions about what could, what could be safely released. Uh, and the more powerful and potent the knowledge was, uh, the greater caution. John Simon introduces us to, became a philosopher uh, uh, of science uh, and, and a, a, stu a student of sociology of science, uh, who came up with, with a very nice uh, uh, mnemonic, uh, which is based on the idea of uh, kudos, uh, rec uh, recognition uh, 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 for distinction uh, and, and congratulation, uh, to remember uh, the key, the key uh, norms of cooperation, uh, universalism, which is essentially open access, that anyone who can, anyone who's qualified to do, to make the practice, no matter where they come from and what their social standing is and uh, what their, what, what their, uh, their, their ethnic or uh, religious identity, anyone should be allowed uh, to practice uh, in this, uh, in the field. Universal activity. Disinterestedness does not mean that you're disinterested in the research, but you have no other interest in the outcome. You, know, you don't have a pre, a, a, a preformed notion of what is what will be the right answer uh, in terms which derives not from your scientific intuition, but derives from how an answer to the question as to will benefit you or others uh, who are in a power relationship to you. Uh, openness, I think we've, uh, we've, ha we have, uh, we've talked about. And the last one is related to one of the benefits uh, of open disclosure, uh, which is that it permits the exercise of skepticism, okay? That it took something uh, in the world in which open science emerged uh, for you to question uh, a claim by someone that you had, dis that you had discovered something that was original or interesting or a new phenomenon. But 
you express doubt, uh, you were in some sense uh, saying, I don't believe you, okay? Uh, the demand to have it demonstrated produced uh, serious problems in a hierarchical society uh, where people are from lower social orders did not sort of question uh, uh, the, uh, the work. This was a matter of honor. People, you know, people were subjected to, uh, if they were re reasonably equal, they were subjected to challenges uh, to, to, if, uh, to satisfy the other person whose honor had been, uh, had been impeached uh, by having doubt expressed. So uh, this, uh, this gives you uh, another set of idealized socialized norms and their, fu and their functional uh, role uh, within, uh, within this, uh, the, uh, the system. Uh, and uh, from this comes a set of stylized procedural arrangements which have come to be increasingly uh, insti institutionalized or formally institutionalized. This would say substantial autonomy of individuals in agenda control in the design and conduct of research. Uh, and this goes with responsibility for the research, for the conduct of the research, uh, and uh, the need for validation of a claim to have made a scientific uh, contribution, and therefore to be qualified for the reward. So uh, this uh, diagram, for those people who like figures and get the sense of everything uh, from having it schematically, and shows the degree of interdependence of the different elements uh, of, the, of the process of the rapid accumulation of knowledge, uh, which uh, are uh, interlocked because they work, they work together. So that disclosure norms, rapid disclosure and therefore rapid access to others is connected uh, as an outcome of priority races, okay, which in turn comes from you know, the reward system, okay, which is from the viewpoint of the individual. Uh, so the, the norms instruct uh, racing, racing for priority and disclosure, which then leads to publication pr uh, processes, uh, and the publication processes support uh, the, uh, supposed to support the, re the reward system. Uh, and the validation which flows from that disclosure feeds uh, not only new knowledge, but more reliable knowledge, okay? Reliable knowledge on which others can, uh, can build. So let me just uh, 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 flag uh, uh, things without going into them to, to say that I have not idealized this in, uh, system in order uh, to say that it's a perfect system. Uh, it was Many of the defects of the system have been long recognized, and there have been you know, various efforts and proposals to change them. Uh, in a recent uh, re-examination of people who have a vision of changing the system, uh, they, uh, they often say that this, you know, by, do by doing away with a large part of the system, we'll do away with its inefficiencies, yes, but you will also do away with the system. And then you will ask, well, what is it that you will reconstruct that will have that will be able to simulate many of the functional features of the system without bringing uh, back these inefficiencies. So the attack on inefficiency calls for a more, a more sophisticated uh, set of solutions uh, which, are, uh, which are taken and framed within the more complicated system of, if you like, different component parts which will have to work together. So priority-based rewards creates a conflict between incentives to compete and the norms of cooperation and openness, okay? And this is typically is uh, resolved by sort of dynamic switching uh, in modern times. The same person uh, who is working in a lab in an open science mode uh, sets up across the street uh, a startup. Uh, and in the startup, uh, everything is secret. Uh, uh, people are uh, forced to uh, leave their notebooks uh, in the end of the at, at the end of, of the day, uh, they if if you can uh, put restrictions on their ability to work in the same industry uh, or in the same uh, in the same region in the same industry, uh, you do so. Uh, so uh, and then and then uh, the payment structure uh, is uh, is conditioned on the payoff to the firm. Okay. Uh, 
right? and then we have all kinds of distributional roles. Uh, and then they switch back and they come back into their, into their lab and try to operate leaving that mode of management behind. Okay? Uh, and there are lots of, uh, of, of obvious conflicts in which people uh, re use research assistants uh, in, a pri in, a, in, a, in a private uh, for-profit business. Uh, which is not beneficial in their role as the supervisor of the person's uh, research, okay? or that they restrict the kind of research that the person uh, is doing, or they channel them to do research uh, on something which will support uh, the interest of the firm, uh, promising that that will lead, uh, if they can't get an academic position, then they will be able to work for the firm. So th this is a sort of the, the corruption of one of their roles because of their conflict of interest. So they are not, they're not only disinterested in the answer, they are also, uh, they don't have disinterest in the process. Right? Okay. Peer interest affects the expected size of the rewards, uh, and, and this induces herding, excess concentration of effort on particular topics. So hot topics uh, which, in which the people are contributing, are getting a lot of attention, lead more people to come into the field. This leads to uh, ex excess concentration uh, of resources on solving certain problems which, which are only important because they have been deemed important. So this is the uh, manifestation of uh, famous for being famous. Okay. And so this is a positive feedback system which can lead to gross distortions. These, most of these uh, look like bubbles uh, and they eventually last everybody, you know, Either the thing is solved, or it turns out to, to be not so interesting, and the, everybody leaves, and you know, the herd goes someplace else. Okay. And one sees this uh, if, you, if, you, if you read uh, people who monitor uh, which, which are the 100 hottest papers, and so forth. Okay. They're relatively short-lived. Tournament-like payoff structures induces wasteful, inefficient, inefficient racing behavior. A tournament structure is where the winner takes most of the prize, okay? So if you're five minutes ahead of, uh, of somebody at the patent office and it's first to file rules, uh, there's no pay, nothing for the second person who comes. Similarly, uh, there is a tournament-like payoff in getting your paper into uh, public, a public journal, a published journal, a published journal of a particular rank in the payoff structure. Uh, uh, so that leads, again, uh, to inefficient race. From a society's viewpoint, uh, we don't really care you know, whether the solution uh, to, let's say, the location uh, of the uh, BR, uh, BR1 uh, and 2, the breast cancer, uh, the, uh, the gene which has, that disposes, predisposes the breast, fat, the breast cancer uh, is on this part or that part of, the, of a particular chromosome three days earlier. Okay, the amount of that difference in time in terms of social benefit is negligible. But for the career of the researchers, it's terribly important. The payoff is very large. And that disproportionate thing leads to inefficient, uh, inefficiency in that people will sacrifice uh, resource expenditures in, for speed, for speed, because what's for them is payoff is speed. Society cares that it gets done in, timely fashion, uh, but usually the waste occurs in the very last phases uh, where you are really throwing every resource that you have to try to get, uh, get the result out before somebody else does. Positive feedback from reputation effects, uh, which give people differential access to research inputs, leads to what's called path dependence in career dynamics. That is, if you are lucky enough to publish a paper which is, answers a, a problem which a number of people are interested in, even though, yes, even though you were not, uh, uh, didn't require great brilliance, your career is off to a flying start, and then uh, your second paper would really be probably ignored, except that you now have sufficient grant funding to attract uh, better graduate students, uh, you can have more people on your research team. 
you have better equipment, you can move to a better university which has a better record and site evaluations. And so your second paper, uh, thus it isn't uh, like the second novel which falls well below the first, you can keep that standard. And then you become trapped uh, by your past reputation, so you have to work harder, you know, which explains a well-known uh, psychological phenomena uh, that is, as scientists become more and more established, you know, they complain of the amount of work uh, which they are having to do and the fact that they are over, overburdened uh, with work. And that was even before um, funding cutbacks required people to be writing overlapping grant, grant proposals all the time. Okay, um, so this is well, this ph phenomena uh, is uh, called the Matthew effect in the famous paper by, how many people have heard this phrase, the Matthew effect? Okay, so, okay, that's, okay, people in science uh, have come across this. And the reference is to, to uh, uh, Matthew, the book of Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector, uh, by the way. Uh, and the view is, uh, Matthew sort of uh, said, uh, to those who have, more shall be given. Uh, and to those who have not, even the little that they have uh, will be shall be taken, or will be taken away. Okay, and so this is, uh, th this is what, uh, positive feedback will do. And finally, public patronage means that societal needs has to be translated into government science policy by a political process, which creates more scope for private interest uh, to get into this, uh, into this problem. Uh, you know, because the scientific uh, uh, activity is not able to implement, uh, not able to implement and exploit the technique. Uh, it's, not, it's not equipped for, and the systems that they would have to uh, that they would have to get in to compete competitively in the market uh, would be at variance uh, with the other systems. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, on uh, on this, uh, other other than to uh, to briefly. Uh, th there's a lot of work in here, and there's a very long paper uh, which you can get. Uh, uh, the the point here is that open science emerged more or less coinci uh, coincidentally in time uh, with uh, the uh, epistemological revolution uh, in science at the beginning of the 17th, uh, late, late 16th, early 17th century. And the epistemological revolution is concerned uh, with the fusion of mathematics and experiment experimentalism, uh, which came from much uh, deeper, deeper trans, uh, trans, uh, uh, traditions uh, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and we are familiar with uh, both the the, p the pioneers uh, of the scientific revolution in uh, Galileo, Kepler, and Descartes, uh, the se and the second generation uh, were more famous in uh, mechanical and experimental uh, natural philosophers, the Boyd, Newton. Uh, these people, uh, uh, Boyd and Newton in particular, uh, were lived in both worlds. They lived in the world of secrets and alchemy and in the world of open uh, publication and scientific societies. Uh, uh, and you know, their, uh, their, their engagement uh, in this other world, uh, the hidden world, uh, uh, is, uh, was, uh, was uh, ex extensive. But they were part, the, the, the alchemical tradition had, had deep medieval roots uh, and what alchemists were hunting for was health, wealth, and power. Uh, they had an instrumental approach to the search for knowledge uh, by experimental methods, uh, uh, the, and the practice was developed uh, into quite sophisticated forms of chemical alchemy uh, in, the, in the 17th century, to which uh, Newton uh, and Boyle, particularly in London, uh, were uh, contributing in these closed circles uh, of alchemists. But they lived in a society in which craft guild constrict, uh, restrictions preserved the mysteries of the trade. Maps were kept, uh, were kept secret. Uh, uh, this is a slide on Newton uh, from uh, Cambridge uh, King's College Library, which has Newton's manuscripts. Uh, Newton uh, wrote more words devoted to alchemy than to any of his scientific writings. And people are telling me I'm devoting more time to this than I, uh, than I should do. Uh, so, uh, in, a, in a word, the problem of 
facing these people uh, at this time was that the patronage system on which they depended uh, was less interested uh, in the content of what they were doing than in the prestige that came from having somebody who was known as a, 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 very, a wise uh, and able person, uh, a, a magus, somebody who could do uh, important things and who actually had pra practical knowledge, which is useful in, des in designing castles, in armies, in irrigation, and things like that. Uh, they were not interested so much in the science and where this knowledge came from, uh, uh, but they were also interested in having this, this kind of person adorn their court, okay? Uh, and so the, the question was, how were they able to evaluate who was a good person or not a good person or a useful person for them to patronize? And so in a short term, kind of a, a more complicated process, what happened was that the people who are competing for patronage jobs figured out that uh, if being famous was important, uh, then what they had to do was to establish their fame among non-patrons, among the people who the patrons would consult. And the patrons would consult the people who they were patronizing. They would say, well, you heard of this person's work. And so they began to openly com com both correspond with people, for telling them about what they had done, telling them of uh, discoveries that they had uh, that had been made and proofs that they had. Uh, they told them about competitions which they had won, okay? And in that way, they began uh, to uh, create the notion that there was a peer reference group and you had to, exp you had to share with them your knowledge in order uh, to attract the kind of patronage uh, and support that you needed to go on with your work. So this is uh, one of these uh, uh, examples of uh, Adam Smith, uh, in which a private vice uh, turn your competition for patronage turns into a public virtue, uh, in which you 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 have to uh, expose what you're doing uh, to other experts so that they can uh, validate for some, a third party that you are uh, that you will be recognized as prince for having this person in your court, okay? Uh, and the, the, the uh, working, working through how this system worked and working out the point that what was problematic was the use of mathematics. Because the, the princes could, un could understand and evaluate uh, their, uh, their artisans who could produce uh, gold and silver uh, objects, or paintings, music, and so forth. But when it came to mathematics, although there were some mathematical princes in Italy, uh, th they were not able to deal with algebra, okay, and with the new mathematics. And so open challenges uh, were a way in which people proved uh, that the new methods uh, of the algorithms uh, would turn out to be uh, more superior uh, than those of the abacus. This is, so this is a, uh, okay. Uh, going to go on. This is just an advertisement of things uh, which you can, dishes, dishes that they were not brought to the table, but they're, they're on view, uh, and you can, you'll find them. Okay. Uh, I think most people are familiar with, the, with the, the points that I wanted to make about the challenge which arose from the expansion of public property rights and the, and the shrinkage or the incursions uh, into, the public, into the public domain uh, that were made uh, by the expansion of property rights uh, uh, starting uh, in, uh, in really in, in the, the, late the late 70s and which uh, really accelerated uh, through, uh, through, the, uh, through the 80s uh, and into, into the early 90s. Uh, and there was a, a reaction against this because of the unintended consequences uh, of stronger IPA for public sector research activities. And I think most people are familiar, if not all, all of the details, uh, of somebody who's lived through this uh, uh, with, the gener with the general problem, uh, as they are uh, with, uh, with the, you know, the irony that uh, the, the sources of the new technologies which disrupted and altered the IPR regime and pushed it into new domains, uh, into the digital world, uh, actually sort of came back 
uh, to damage the very groups that were responsible uh, for the new technologies because mainframe and mainframes networks, uh, the World Wide Web, all came out of, science, of natural scientists uh, building new tools to, uh, to, to meet their needs, okay? Uh, and what we had was a lot of uh, bottom-up responses, okay, uh, from the scientific community to defend open science, to find ways uh, in which to protect uh, the, their control over data uh, and their access to data. And some of these uh, were preoccupied people. Uh, and one of them uh, is, the no, is the idea that even though you have works which are so patents and to copy or to copyrights it's possible for workers for work researchers who need to assemble uh, set tool sets which are privately protected to agree to license them to each other to cross license them to each other by use of private contract and this is the notion of the contractual construction of research commons uh, which uh, which I and others have been involved in in creating uh, space or reopening the space that was closed uh, through this. So this is an ex post, uh, an ex post solution, okay? And so uh, there are a number of examples which people are uh, aware of, and now we have further, uh, further uh, tool, tool building, uh, and, this, and the, tool, the tool building activity uh, uh, has been inspired by open source. And so I think I come to the end of this. Yeah, okay. So uh, I leave, leave you with the, with the thought that, uh, that uh, uh, open source provided a, par uh, a metaphor, uh, but the me metaphor uh, can, uh, uh, can be used as uh, paradigms, and paradigms uh, are, uh, are beyond metaphors in that they commit you to a style of research. An open, so an open source is not like science. Science really has characteristics uh, which open source does not. And open source's characteristics and the environment in which it was became successful is not one that is generally replicated in the science. So one has to be aware that, that trying uh, to uh, take a set of tools and procedures which work in an environment which is not replicated in, uh, in many of the sciences uh, will, will turn out to be either a distortion which will which will di disable uh, some, uh, some sciences. And so you have to, if you're redesigning a system, you really have to start uh, by rethinking the system uh, and design it uh, for the purpose uh, with the tools uh, which will support it. Many of the tools being devised are appropriate uh, for advancing and making scientific operations uh, clearer, but it's not clear that the side conditions which will allow them to be widely used uh, are existing exist, uh, and so a lot more work has to be done. Uh, uh, and uh, from these, uh, from this work, uh, if this is adequately uh, uh, done in ways that do not lead to misapplications, uh, in the hope that you can re-engineer uh, re re an entire organizational and institutional system by providing it with tools. Okay, that you have to do a lot of other things to make sure these tools uh, fit the requirements of the activity, which is not defined in terms of the tool set, then uh, it, it, it will produce good examples which will gather sufficient support to actually undertake the institutional transformations uh, and changes in policy which will be needed. But this is not the quick process, uh, and it's a process that needs the the advice and counsel of people who are working within the communities that have to be shifted uh, uh, rather than coming in from outside, okay? But uh, with doing it the right way opens up a great uh, uh, and exciting prospect uh, uh, if one can avoid uh, the errors. So I thank you and I thank you for your patience.